On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're going to talk about the role of a virtual executive assistant and how to utilize them effectively. That's next. Welcome to Bootstrappers, a unique program designed to help make your business better. From property management to remote workers, Bootstrappers is here to help your business succeed. Bootstrappers is a production of Anaquim LLC. So let's lace up those business boots and join Bootstrappers with Jeremy and Gwen Aspen. Welcome to Bootstrappers, where we talk about topics that are important to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Gwen Aspen, here with my spouse, Jeremy Aspen. Me! And we are here today with Emily Hayen, who is the Director of Sales at Anaquim, and we're going to talk today about how to effectively use a executive assistant, which is an interesting topic. People are always asking me about that. Always asking about that. Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. We help transform and scale your business, make it more profitable, whether it's virtual assistance, whether it's a back office support product or an emergency call center, we've got you covered. If you're a fan of the show, please like, subscribe, tell all your friends, and um, also participate in our book giveaway. We'll be giving away an incredible book at the end of the show. Just go to the description in this, uh, in the notes of this on YouTube, or go to the bio in our Instagram, which is the Bootstrapper Show. And if you leave a nice little comment for us, you could win that book giveaway of the week. So. Today we are talking about an executive assistant, which I get asked on a weekly basis, oh, you have an executive assistant, can you give me the job description? Like on a weekly basis, people ask for it. Yeah, so, and there's a distinction to be made here, and I wanna do it at the front end, because it, um, a virtual assistant, people get the impression that that is supposed to be their assistant. And I think that that's how the industry started out, where they just hi would hire somebody maybe in another country that would, be their assistant in the traditional sense where they kind of hop on email, they check things and they help lubricate the life of the executive. Um, and that's I think what we're mostly talking about today but it's important to understand and I think it's especially for the smaller companies that's not always what you need. Sometimes, and actually I would say especially for smaller companies, you actually need like a virtual professional or virtual assistant to help you do the work, do the daily work like of the, the company. operational work. Do the operation. So this, I think a virtual assistant is more of an advanced stage of yes. remote professionals or Absolutely. virtual assistants. And, and that's what we're talking about today. Thank right. you for making that distinction because yes, the, we hire all the, and I'm gonna bring Emily in. Hi, Emily. Mm, hello. How are you? I'm wonderful. Welcome to the show. Thank you, my first time. <laughs> it is? I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so you- You're uh, doing great so far. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so you hire virtual assistants, or as we call them, remote professionals for people all over the place, uh, or, or all over the United States. For what kind of roles do you typically hire for? for a, a remote professional? Sure, sure. I would say some of our most popular are um, maintenance coordinators, um, administrative assistants, uh, reception, and um, executive assistant actually is becoming um, more prevalent. We're getting a lot more requests for that. Um, but I would say those are our top ones. Okay, so executive assistant is a tough role because I've actually, in the past, failed at this position like I've hired them and then been like oh my god this is not what I want and then actually transitioned them to more operational roles later so it's really important to be thoughtful about an executive assistant role would you agree I would agree I would say um, it has to be somebody that um, is compatible with your personality so it has to be a really good personality match because they're going to be dealing with you day in day out all day long and vice versa so it's really important that that that's a really good uh, piece of the relationship and that you take time on the front end um, to ensure it is a good personality match. So also, you really need a strong job description. Don't a lot of people, they go in and they, oh, I'm just overwhelmed. They just know they're overwhelmed. And then they say they want an executive assistant, but when they come up with a job description, it's not thorough enough. It's not enough for a 40 hour week. And just to insert a little bit into this, it is somebody's life. So you're dealing with somebody that one, you're probably gonna care about and you're certainly gonna ask that they care about you and especially in making your life a little bit better. And it, you have to treat it that way. Like go into a position, this goes with any position, but 
you need to have a description. They need to know what they're getting into and they need to be able to measure themselves because if you don't do that, especially I think in this executive assistant role, it's really easy to just fall apart. It is. And I mean, like I said, I've failed at this before where I hired one and then I was like, oh God, I, this doesn't work for me. And then I move them into a different role. But having key performance indicators for this role is pretty difficult too. So mm -hmm. I bring you, Emily, not only because you are like a hiring specialist and so you can always consult people on what their true needs are and get to like the root cause of their stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and overwhelm, but you've also had an executive assistant or have one. Yeah. And so when you were getting to the point where you were overwhelmed and you needed one, what were the key tasks that you had them do well, for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think my first indicator that I needed one was when I knew that things were falling through the cracks. And as somebody that really prides themselves on their performance, I was like, I don't like the feeling of knowing things are getting by me. So I think that was like my first indicator that I needed one. But um, so when I went to look for one, I really had to start thinking about like, what can I give them? Them, what can I not give them? Um, <clears throat> just the different tasks that I could trust them with. And so, uh, the what are some examples? Yeah. So, I think the biggest things um, that I would have her do was help manage my email. Um, and so, if I knew that I was going to be delayed in getting back with somebody, um, I could handle. I could give that to her to handle on my behalf. So, a lot of it started there. So, where she really kind of got got a good feel for the business, um, my role, everything that kind of was involved in that. So she knew what to expect. Um, so it really started kind of as simply as that. It worked into, of course, paperwork um, and general admin tasks. Um, but a lot of it was just making sure I followed up. Like it was almost being my keeper in a sense. So, so with the email for your role, how did you exactly have her deal with your email? Because everyone kind of does it a little bit differently. Did she actually respond on your behalf or did you have her take the email and respond from her own email account? How did you do that? I had her, she was kind of the first line of defense to prioritize my responses. So that's how I did it. Um, if there was something that she could follow up um, on my behalf that didn't need a response directly from me, then she would take care of those. From her own email. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And we say past tense because she got promoted. She did. <laughs> she did. Yeah. So um, we're searching for your new, for your replacement right yeah. now. So that's yep. why if I, people are like, well, why are we using the past mm -hmm. tense? It's just that she excelled so much, we promoted her. But um, so, so she would answer from her own email. So I'm doing it a little bit differently with George where I'm having him respond from my email so that the th threads are consistent but he's just signing it George executive assistant in the email. What do you have to say? We're going to end up fixing something that you're doing because Google has <laughs> a way of making it so that it comes from him at on your behalf. Okay. Yeah, it's automatic and it's it's what you need to do. We'll set that up. Okay. Yeah, put me yeah. on that list. So <laughs> one of the one of the things Always room for improvement. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. especially when it comes to technology and Gwen and I, so. Yeah. Um, and there's also controls you can put in place. But so a lot of times people are thinking a uh, virtual assistant then is that somebody that can buy fl for guides especially like buy flowers presents set up dinner reservations and do all that sort of coordination also yes absolutely but i always tell people too when they come to me saying they're needing an executive assistant is be very transparent up front if it's going to bleed into your personal life you know so just as as transparent as you can be on the front end about you know, maybe some sensitive things that they'll handle on your behalf and how do they deal with that and establishing those kind of guidelines to make sure that things are kept private like or mistresses. That, oh my God. <laughs> things like that. You know, like, so I did, I did put in my job description and I put it in my notes just so I remembered everything I had, but I have, uh, the fact that it is a fireable offense to disclose any information because uh, my amazing executive assistant George sees personnel issues. Yeah. He sees financial documents. I mean, he has a lot access to a lot of things through the way that I have it set up in Google. And if I even, and I told him on the front end in the interview, I was like, this is, you have to 
you have to be ironclad safe for me to share things with. And if I even hear of you sharing anything, it is a fireable offense. And it was super upfront. It was written in the job description and we talked about it. So that's a really important thing for people to know. Yeah, absolutely. So it's also for that role because of the sensitivity, and especially when you're doing it for an executive, you, this is advice. You have to have a password protection system, like a keeper or a last pass, because if something should happen, you've got to be able to make a change immediately, turn off that account, and everybody loses access, or yeah. that person loses access to everything. And it has to be that way. Yeah, I think people are not very safe with passwords. At all. And luckily, in most cases, people are amazing, and they are just, responsible and they just are trustworthy and we rarely have issues but once if you have an issue it's a disaster we all learned it from the hacker and like the pipeline recently who asked for wh oh, however many right. millions in bitcoin or whatever but um i mean it can happen it happens to big companies it happens to small companies you just have to play it safe and that's where the credit card information also can be in one of those systems oh like yeah an auto mm -hmm. um auto what do they fill the credit yeah. card without seeing it right and then you can have them do some of those personal tasks for you as well but you're right be up front because you don't want someone to get in the role and be like i thought this was like admin and now i'm you know getting Sending appointments your for flowers. your yeah. <laughs> dog to be groomed like that wasn't part of the job description yeah. <clears throat> so and also the personnel i want to go back to what you said yeah. about the personality so um, for my executive assistant, one of their roles, and this is one of my favorite things about this, is we have several different departments at the company. We're all on this 9D software for our meetings. So one of his roles is to look at each department's uh, meetings and look and see if any of the data is out of scope. So in the software, it turns red if it's out of scope. So he has to bring all those up for me, and if someone doesn't fill it out, he is a follow-up person, so he follows up, hey, this isn't filled out, we need this for the week so that we can hold people accountable. And then we have a working Word doc, which is probably not the best way to do this, but because I can't be in all of the company meetings um, all the time, people commit things to me, and then I never follow up because I don't have that regular meeting where I, I follow up like we do for each department. So we have all the follow-ups, all the tasks that he could do, if, like if he has time, like downtime, so that there's not a down minute in his 40 hours a week. How did you keep very busy um, and maintain that kind of accountability with her role? Yeah, so we had to meet um, pretty regularly um, because you know, you walk in on a Monday morning and you've got your week planned to the T and Monday by 10, it's a totally different week. And so checking in frequently to adjust to changes to, you know. When you say frequently, how frequently? A couple times a day. I mean, you know, it's not once an hour by any stretch, but, uh, but frequently enough uh, so that you can make sure you're on the same page, tackle any issues that are kind of coming up that are, you know, of a higher priority. One thing, one comment I wanted to make um, about, you know, for you and George responding on your behalf, I always think it's really important to, to establish with your team that this person's an extension of you. Yes. And, you know, that they are acting on your direction so that, because I think that that can sometimes cause some issues or some frictions or questions. So I think that's something also. That is true. I, and I did clarify my philosophy with George. I'm like, we are working together. Your the person who's going to follow up on all these commitments and he does it in a nice way which is very consistent with my uh, style so he'll be like hey Emily mm -hmm. just following up so I'm a direct but nice person and he compliments that very well so he's just kindly following up and um, and I needed that personality characteristic for somebody who worked with me so to have the same similar like a similar style of addressing people i think is really important which is why i chose him to be my executive assistant so think about and i also couldn't have somebody who would just do whatever i said so right. he's more detail oriented and he'll be like you haven't followed up on that email like he has a, his own sense of urgency which 
is compatible with me. So he kind of holds me accountable. And I needed that in an executive assistant. So yeah. not only does he hold other people accountable, but he also holds me accountable because sometimes I don't like to follow rules. Yeah. I right. like make rules for other people. And I'm like, well, I don't really follow the rules. And then talking about the cadence, though, we meet at 8.15 every single morning. So we have that standing meeting. And then the rest of the day, we meet throughout the day, too. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps. So you had paperwork. Was it consistent paperwork that she would do that has always been on you? Because I think having a consistent project is really important. So, and that's the one thing about an executive assistant role is you can jump from one priority and task so quickly from one to the other, um, you know, because for the nature of my assistant for Viri, um, it was very much, you were rolling through and getting in business throughout the day. So contracts are being sent and signed and paperwork was being done throughout the entire day. And in between that, she had to work on her projects. So mm -hmm. I always had a project for her to work on in downtime. If if not one, like three different, and they were pre, you know kind of pet projects, things that I would love to do if I had the time to do. Um, so that was nice. Um, in, in, in that sense, she was compatible with me because uh, I could give her a general idea of what I wanted and she could take it and run with it. And so that was important for my assistant. So if someone needs that, they have to uh, ask for those kinds of things in the interview. Not everybody is gonna be able to take an abstract idea yes. and be able to just run with it and research it and take liberties. Not everyone's gonna feel comfortable with that. So that's a personality type that has mm -hmm. to be addressed in the interview process. Yeah, and, and not asking that question directly, because everybody's going to be like, well, yeah, whatever you need. You know, you have to ask situational questions, mm -hmm. and it will reveal to you how they work. Um, and that, I, I have found, is really helpful just to get a good idea of what they, how they operate. So. so I think, and Jeremy, you could probably chime in to here. A lot of people, they just feel overwhelmed. They know they need to hire someone, but they don't know exactly what the role is. It's the overwhelming feeling that causes them to feel like they need the hire. So I think they should just write down all the projects on their list that have to be completed or things that are loose ends and, and see if that's a job, like an operational role, or if that's an assistant role. Is that how you think people should start when they're overwhelmed on figuring out what kind of role they want? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, people be default to, I need an executive assistant. That's the very first one. And I think part of it, this is a little philosophical, but I think part of it is because there's a semantic, it's, it's it's tied to our psyche semantically because we say virtual assistant because that's the word that people use. And of course, embedded in that is the word assistant. And so immediately what you're taking with you is this idea that they're there to help you, like in kind of that traditional sense. And I, I just don't think that that's necessarily true. Usually the things that you don't have time for aren't the flower, aren't ordering the flowers. It's not setting the reservations. It's that you're too busy doing the other stuff to mm. get to it. So jump ahead a little bit in your day and find out what it is that's occupying it that is transactional, task oriented, and try to set it up so that person can do that. If you can set something up like that for somebody to do, that's probably more than more what you want than than the traditional idea of, of an assistant. So one area where I think these executive assistants really help out is with salespeople who are like hunters and they are really bad with details or paperwork. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> me, me as well. And so in order to get your salesperson, salespeople generally make pretty good money. I mean, not everybody's a hunter. Those personality types are a little bit rare. And so when you find a good hunter, you don't want them checking the boxes and making sure everything's perfect right. in the paperwork. And so the way to get the most out of a hunter is to pair them up with a detail-oriented um, admin administrative assistant, right, Emily? Yeah, I mean, I always equate it to every minute that I spend on admin work is revenue that we're missing out on. I mean, mm -hmm. that simply, um, because I believe in it that strongly, um, because it's just, it's so important. You've got to use people where their strengths lie and, you know, trying to put a salesperson that just wants to sell behind a desk and figuring out all the details they're they're not going to, they're not going to succeed in that. So, and I don't, I do think though, salespeople need to learn the admin stuff first. So we don't 
generally give salespeople an administrative assistant right off the bat. They have to kind of earn that alert because I also want them to have compassion for the paperwork because paperwork is important so that the operations sure. moves smoothly. So even if they're going to fail a little bit, they still have to do it on the front end. And then when they prove themselves, then we get them an assistant. But an assistant isn't needed for every role. Like Jeremy, right now, do you feel like you don't have an executive assistant? Do you feel like you need one? No. No, I, I would rather have like the quality department answering to me because that they have they can get in anywhere that they want and it's business. Like I don't really want someone as an exe- as an executive assistant or virtual assistant. I want and this is why we use the term remote professionals. Like I want them to be tied to our our task at hand, which is to you know operate our business. So that's kind of the distinguishing. That, so that, talk about that quality role because I think this is why these job descriptions are so important because people think they need one thing and then when they write down what they're really looking for, and I think quality is the perfect area where people think that they need somebody, but it's really a quality control person. What? How would you differentiate? those needs between a quality control person and, and a and a virtual assistant of an executive or i'm sorry an yeah, executive so, assistant well the quality executive. the quality department really is just i kind of think of them like in the wake of you know the boat where you're doing something you're going somewhere and then they're kind of back there just trying to make sure that things are stay in place they're not letting the quality department makes it so entropy doesn't get its raggedy hands around the corporation and and start to um, get sloppy. Get sloppy. So the quality department is just there to I the way I think of it is to have uh, to be the checks and balances to, uh, that people that the organization is staying in the lane and then staying so, in the lane meaning staying. W- within the pr- procedures and processes that are yeah and that then, are written down because and when it comes to the company that's kind of the main my main objective i want the quality department to make sure that we're sticking to our tasks you've always designed companies where the quality department reports to the executive yeah so um and so a lot of people would think of that intellectual or perceive that as a as, as a executive assistant but you actually make it its own department and they can put their hands into any departments yeah so the logic there is that if there's a written procedure and it's approved by the leadership and they discover that somebody's not sticking to it then that person that's not sticking to it is a candidate for uh, some sort of reprimand right and that's that and that's really the only thing that matters is if we've taken the time to design it just need to have somebody there to make sure that people are sticking to what it was that was already determined to be best. And now they also look for opportunities to make things better. So and that, that for me, I, having an executive assistant for me isn't even that interesting um, because the most of my time is just trying to pick up pieces um, after entropy gets its hold. So, okay, so for our quality department, just because people could argue that, that George is my executive assistant is quality. He just follows up on commitments, but our quality department at Anaquim looks at process procedure and ensures that those are followed and then lets a manager know if someone needs to be retrained or isn't following through. Mm-hmm. So and that's he, an important distinction. Yeah, it's also quality is a very, it's a very, very um, uh, powerful role because you can, with quality, you can get into anything. Mm-hmm. If, if that's your title, you can go anywhere in the company and find a problem and work on fixing it. And so, then, yeah, and that's to your point. Like, what is the role of an executive assistant? That yes. for me is more my thing. But people might need someone to help them manage the kids. Maybe they're divorced, and they that that's a. a but dis- that would be an in person. That's not a virtual role. So well, yeah, going to yeah the softball games and stuff, but <laughs> or baseball, I guess. But yeah. Right. So, so, and then that's where we talk about the virtual. So where do you think people need an actual assistant physically in their area versus where they can utilize a remote 
executive assistant? Yeah, so I think the biggest need for maybe somebody in person is like Jeremy alluded to, if there's running around involved in it. Um, because really everything else, I mean, we live in such a digital world that you can really do everything virtually. So, um, and, you know, if, <clears throat> for example, you're in the property management industry and you might need an executive assist assistant to act as a runner to go to different properties, to pick up things, to meet a vendor here or there, you know, that's obviously where it's going to be more important to be in person. But I mean, if it's just kind of, you know, how we utilize them managing our, our days, keeping um, up with our priorities, managing emails, you know, that's absolutely stuff that can be done and, remotely. And I think a lot of the things that people thought they needed an executive assistant for in person, like, oh, I'm running late, I need lunch. They felt like they needed that person to go get them lunch. But now we have Uber Eats. So they could even order your lunch for you and have it delivered, and that even saves you yeah. a, a I, local person. I kind of think nowadays that, I'm not trying to beat anybody up, or and I might be wrong, I, I should probably throw that out there, but to me, a resident assistant, like somebody that is a physical assistant, that's more of a peacock feather. Like that, well, that's okay, so I want to differentiate this too. I'm always honest that I have a lot of help at home because I feel like that is feminism. I don't want anyone thinking I work out and I work all this time and I go to my kids' things and I do housework all day. I don't. I don't do housework all day. So I and have I somebody either, else so do leaves. my housework no for me. Right. <laughs> so I, I have somebody do my housework for me. And so. I have a house manager, which is different than executive assistant, which is different than quality control, which is different than what you've had and your salespeople have, which is more of an administrative assistant, right? Right. So it's really important. I know we're, it may seem like we're parsing this out, but if you want the role to be successful, you have to be very clear on what your needs are. Do you need someone to do laundry and dishes for you? Well, that's a house manager. That's different than an executive assistant. Absolutely. And it's going to be a different personality type. So being really clear on that is important because otherwise, to Jeremy's point at the beginning of the show, someone's, you could be hiring the wrong role. Someone quits a good job to work with you and then it's not what you needed and it's a disaster and you end up firing them. Yeah. And for no fault of their own. Yeah. And I think um, you tell me, like when you're talking to clients, do you sometimes get the impression that part of their decision making is statusy? Or, or or that's why they might be quick to try to get a virtual assistant because there's kind of a status. Or, or, you mean an executive assistant? Oh, I'm sorry, an executive assistant because there's some sort of a status in having an executive assistant. Yeah, you know, I would say that's actually pretty pretty rare. I mean, most people are just earnestly looking to to get assistance, but um, you know, I, yeah, I I wouldn't say that's the majority. Mm, Most no. people are just, the first thing is they're overwhelmed and they just yeah. want to fix that feeling of being overwhelmed. Would you agree? Yeah, exactly. I mean, most people come to me and they're like, I need help, but I, I don't even know where to start. And so that kind of starts the process of like uncovering what are your biggest pain points. And then we, we work from there and kind of come up with a list. So, okay. So anything else that people need to know before they hire an executive assistant? My biggest advice, um, honestly, and it's always on any remote person, but anybody that's going to be working with you um, so closely is getting time to know each other and knowing that that's part, an important part of working well together is knowing each other, um, you know, personally, professionally, um, you know, all of those things. I just feel like it ha it's a good base for a strong relationship. I totally agree with that. And so just leave a little time to have some levity, some humor, mm -hmm. and tell a story or two and and get to know them as a human being especially if they're going to be in in all of your emails and knowing everything about you. It just seems like there should be some parity there where you know a little bit about them as well. Mm -hmm. yep. I would just say, like, if you're considering hiring somebody for a virtual role, virtual assistant, executive assistant, whatever, make a list of the things that you do on a daily basis. Do a list of the things that you neglect. And then in a third column, put everything over there that you think you should be doing, whether, you know, that is properly your responsibility. Make that list and everything else can can go to somebody else. I think... You, I don't think it's right to say that you make a list of everything you do. It's you because there's a lot of things you're not doing, but you should be. 
And so you just have to kind of make sure to understand. So you're the saying difference. add a little vision to the the exercise of figuring out who you yeah who you're going to hire, and look at it under ideal circumstances. What would my role be? Yep. If I do do this role that would be ideal, then what are the tasks that I can hand off to someone well, else? Yeah, and it, it should include the things you're not doing, I should preface it, with, at home. Like the things, you know, being a business owner, it's kind of hard to maintain a family. So what are the things you're not doing at home? And then what are the things mm. you can replace, you know, you can not do at your office so that you can have time to do the things that I think for most people are the most important things in your life. That would, I, I think that would that's be a more good. Mo, that's a good point to end on. Right. I appreciate. Well, that. I've got one other thing to end on. What? That email thing. <laughs> so, um, there are some. There's exposure to sharing your username and password for your email. For and sure. And we're going to change this before this airs because we don't want George doing these things. He wouldn't. <laughs> but um, they can change your password. And if you have administrative rights, they can make it so that you can't ever change it back. Like so they can essentially take over your account into perpetuity. Well, he has it in Keeper. Does that fix it? No. <laughs> um, and, and if they're signed in as you, they can sign contracts. So the, theoretically, okay. you'd, they would be able to set it up so that somebody can commit Anaquim to your company, you that can commit your company through you to whatever contract they want. So, I mean, that's just a couple of the things that that's the danger of having the email actually shared. So if you're not using the Microsoft or the Google, you know, Gmail thing suite, you, you can't have an assistant in your email. Okay, well that's very important information. It's big, it's a big deal. <laughs> I'm glad we went over this right? during this podcast so we could get this worked out and you can fix it for me. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so we have to talk about the book giveaway. So I love this book. I don't know if you all have read it or not, but Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity by David Allen is amazing. And so if you'd like to participate in the book giveaway, please go to uh, the YouTube, this, uh, the description in this YouTube video, or go to Instagram, Bootstrapper Show, click on the bio and leave us a note and you could win the book this week. So with that, that's a wrap. This has been Bootstrappers, a unique presentation designed to help you better understand how the world turns. Contact Gwen or Jeremy at posts at bootstrappers.club or visit our website, anaquim.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and our YouTube channel. Thank you and join us next time for Bootstrappers.